Today we are at the Kentucky Reptile Zoo where we are going to learn all about hot or venomous species. I will fully admit that we don't do a lot of work with uh, hot species in captivity. The closest thing we have would be our false water cobras which are mildly venomous. So they're like warm species but they're definitely not venomous to the point where they can cause any permanent damage. So since we are going to be learning a lot today, we figured we'd bring the cameras along so that you can learn with us. Before we start today's video though, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, Blackview. They produce rugged smartphones for outdoor activities and they sent us the 9600 Pro for us to try out and we were truly impressed with this phone. This thing has a 6.2 inch AMOLED display. It's waterproof, it's dust proof. Uh, it has a 16 megapixel camera that can film in 1080p. It has nearly double the battery capacity as the Google Pixel 3, the iPhone 10R, and the Samsung Galaxy S9. Basically, this phone is just as good a phone as the higher end competitors like Apple's, Samsung's, and uh, Google phones, but at about half the price. Our original plan was to take this phone on a herping trip and find some snakes and other reptiles to film, but unfortunately, because of the time of year, we didn't find anything. So instead, we're going to film the majority of today's video at the Kentucky Reptile Zoo using this phone, and in the spring, when it warms up, we'll take it on a real herping adventure. But I think now it's time to see some venomous reptiles. <laughs> So Jim founded the zoo in 1990. The purpose of it and the reason that he decided to, to do it was basically the old way of extracting venom was you would collect the snakes from the wild, you would extract from them, maybe you would force feed them some, and they wouldn't live very long. They would live maybe six months to a year. Uh -huh. And then you would just go out and get more snakes because there's an unlimited right. supply in the wild, right? Yep. Yeah. And so he felt like that really was wrong, that there was a better way that it could be done. And he wanted to prove that you could provide venom, but also have healthy animals that lived a long time in captivity. So that's mm -hmm. kind of his vision. But we also feel like if the animal is in captivity, it should be being used in as many ways as it can be. So that's one of the reasons we're open to the public is we try to have at least one of everything on exhibit. So not only can you extract venom, but you can also educate at the same time since you have the animals exactly. already. Right. That's right. fantastic. Um, and that's also why we try to make them available for non-invasive research too. So we've had uh, people here who were studying like that, how snakes strike or venom expenditure. Uh, we provide samples for DNA, that wow. sort of thing. And that's kind of the same idea is that the snakes are here, they should be getting used because they're not in the wild doing what they're supposed to be doing. So right. we want to, you know, as long as we're not injuring them, we want to make sure that they're useful in as many ways as we can. So right now, I think we're probably between, I don't know, 16, 1700 individuals. Oh my gosh. <laughs> probably around a hundred species. Um, most of what we have is venomous. We do have 30 or 40, maybe 40 or so colubrids that we use for educational programs. So, so those are the ones that you bring to schools too. and you mm -hmm. bring to scouts. Okay. Yeah. But most of what we have is venomous stuff. Uh, Do you acquire most of your snakes then from your own breeding? Yes, probably the majority of the snakes that are here were born here. We do have some snakes that are were captured in the wild, like some of our western diamondbacks that come to mm -hmm. us because they were nuisance animals. So oh, okay. they weren't able to be relocated to a good place. Do you do you, do you call it extracting or milking? Well, we try to call it extracting. Okay. Milking. There you go, guys, call it extracting, not milking. <laughs> milking is not wrong, but extraction is the more technical or more proper term. Right. right. So we try to say extraction. Um, it's not like you're milking the. Right. Okay, it's yeah. not a cow. Yeah, exactly. The snake is perfectly it's happy if extracting. you don't extract from it. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends on the snake how frequently they're extracted from. So some snakes you can extract from once every two weeks. Some snakes are more easily stressed out or more affected by the stress and we give those a longer period of time. So mm -hmm. sometimes three weeks, sometimes four weeks. We base that on yield. So if the snake is healthy and doing well on whatever schedule it's on, it will maintain that yield of venom. For, What's average? It varies widely depending I, on what it is. The species, mm -hmm. yeah, I suppose. So I mean something like an average size western diamondback mm -hmm. or an average size Asian cobra may give somewhere on the order of a quarter to a third of a gram in one extraction. If you notice that the snake over a period of time its yield is dropping, that's an indication that something is not happy for that animal. So mm -hmm. either, you know, maybe it needs to eat more, maybe it needs to be extracted from less frequently, but something right. like that. Okay. Just, you have to kind of, I usually kind of put a finger in. The snakes that are extracted from on a very regular basis. So ones we have a standing order for, there's a reason for us to be extracting as frequently as we can. They also eat a lot more than you would feed your pet snakes or snakes that you have for- produce it. Whatever, yeah. yeah. Part of that is stress and part of it is they're making the venom. Mm -hmm. 
So Western Diamondbacks, for example, we produce about almost 100 grams a month of Western Diamondback wow. venom in the active season. They're extracted from every two weeks and they eat every week. Wow, now, okay. a rattlesnake in the wild is not eating anywhere near that often. Mm -hmm. But if we didn't feed them that much, they would not do okay with that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's learning what each species needs in order to stay healthy and then you can maintain them at that. And they'll breed. And I mean, we've had babies born from those guys like while he's still extracting from them and they're they're fine uh, but you do like have grabbing. to make sure they're healthy before you get going the vast majority of the clients that we have are people who are doing research with the venom so okay. they're studying you know cancer they're studying heart disease or oh. you know blood clotting problems or things like that it's probably like two-fifths of our customers are here in the U.S. and the rest are overseas somewhere. Oh, you do so, a lot of exporting. Yeah, yeah, there's quite a few like international things. Again, you know, the venom research community is only so big, so, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not everybody is in this country. So that's the majority of the, the clients that we have. Now, we do also sometimes provide for anti-venom, and then we also uh, provide for the dog vaccine that's available. Um, in the western part of the country. There's a vaccine so, that uses venom? There is, and it's the idea is that it makes the dog last longer to get to a vet. It's not necessarily gonna oh, make the dog like completely immune if it's bitten by the snake, but if okay. you're out hiking or it's a hunting dog or something like that and it's far away, it gives you some time. Wow. That's the idea to get to the vet. I've never heard of that. So vaccine it's, not, it's not available in this part of the country okay. because it, it's made from Western Diamondbacks, so it's just a uh, Western part of the mm -hmm. How does venom become anti-venom? So the process <clears throat> of making anti-venom is actually pretty simple. So you take the venom, you inject it into some animal. Is it usually sheep from when I was researching? Crofab, which is the anti-venom that's until this fall was the only anti-venom approved for use in the U.S., but now there's a competitor. But Crofab is made using sheep. Historically in the world it's been made using horses. You can make antivenom from other animals and from eggs and things as well. Mm -hmm. But historically it's been horses because they have a large blood volume. Oh. So you inject the, the venom into your host animal mm -hmm. in small amounts, not enough to kill it. Um, and you, there's a schedule where you start smaller and increase what they're exposed to. And then that animal produces antibodies for the venom. Then you draw blood from that animal, do a variety of things to clean it. Okay. And that's antivenom. Oh, just You're that. You're just getting the just antibodies yeah, that the horse or sheep or whatever produced against the venom. Wow, I didn't know that was so it. I it's thought pretty there much was more involved. There's there are there are a few varieties on the theme. You can do a mix of venoms and inject that, or you can have like horse A is inoculated with this species, horse B is inoculated with that species. So there's a couple okay. different ways. But then again, you pool those antibodies, and again, th there you go. So is that to be an so, antivenom that's effective against multiple species mm -hmm. of bites? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there's both types that exist. The one that's made from only one species and really only works for that species is called a monovalent. Okay. The if it's oh, made for a bunch, then it's called a polyvalent. Again, not too complicated. After you extract venom from a snake, can you get bit from them? Oh snake? yes. You okay? Yeah. So, so there's still in just any as in pretty much any bite, the snake is never giving everything that it has. And in an extraction, we may, like maybe we're getting a third to half of what the snake has in its venom glands. Okay. And uh, be because we're not forcing the venom out, and I know sometimes people see the video and it looks like Jim's squeezing their head, but I think he was telling you like he can actually feel the muscles around the glands contracting and moving. Mm -hmm. And so what he'll do is when it looks like he's squishing the snake's head, all he's doing is following the snake's own contraction of the muscles. So he's moving with them. He's moving with them and then he's holding it in that position, which is the position that makes the venom come out. So the snake is choosing how much venom to give. And that's true when a snake bites you in the wild. It's true when a snake bites its food. Mm -hmm. They are deciding how much venom to inject based on you know, a variety of factors, probably the size of what they're biting, how freaked out they are if they're biting yeah. in self-defense. When we extract, we're only getting a portion of the venom. So if they bite after that, they absolutely they can. can inject venom. And he's had actually two bites after being, after the snake was extracted from that were still plenty serious. Wow. So, so yeah, it doesn't have, <laughs> it doesn't limit their ability. Right. <laughs> Do you find that since you feed your snakes uh, pretty soon after you extract mm -hmm. from them, do they make that connection and they expect food after they're done being handled? That's an interesting back? question. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it almost looked like the cobra they, that Jim was... That cobra always expects food. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. That's an interesting. I don't think I've ever had anybody ask me that before. I think that it's more that when we feed them frequently, 
they expect food every time we come by. I see. Yeah. And so they're very conditioned that there is going to be food there on a very regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so when you come and open the cage, they're like, oh, hey. <laughs> so it's not they've made the connection between the extraction process and food. They've just connected you with food. I think so. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. I think that's I think that's more what I would say. Mm -hmm. You've had some for many, many years. Yeah, they well, they live a long time if you take care of them, you know. And right. They've got the right genetics. <laughs> yeah, well, there's the, some so. people who are taking advantage of these wild-caught specimens. They keep them alive for a couple of months, but they don't treat them properly so they die after that but you've had that one crate for 40 years or so yeah i don't actually we don't know exactly how old it is okay um but it was originally i think it originally came into a zoo and would lived at that zoo for numerous years and then it came here and so judging by when it was acquired originally it's mm -hmm. at least in its mid to late 40s wow which is crazy and the thing is it doesn't it's not i keep saying this i need to knock on wood <laughs> it's not acting like an old snake Right, not so down. frequently as they age, I mean, you've probably seen this in your own animals, they start to senesce, they don't hold weight as well, they mm -hmm. get a little flabby, mm -hmm. you know, their head kind of starts to look gnarly. Yep. And, and, you know, it's just old age. It is. And this guy just doesn't... So who knows how much longer he'll, he'll I, last. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I keep expecting, like, well, he's got to be getting close, but he, I mean, he eats great. <clears throat> Once antivenom is produced, mm -hmm. how long does it last on the shelf and how is it stored? It depends. Okay. So some antivenoms are liquid, and usually the shelf life on a liquid is like two years. Some are lyophilized. And lyophilized antivenoms have like a three to five year shelf life. Most antivenoms are at least somewhat effective past their expiration date. I will tell you that it is a personal issue of mine that I think if you want to keep venomous snakes, at least exotic ones, you need to have your own antivenom. Mm -hmm. And some people make the argument that it's too expensive and they ask about things like, well, it doesn't, you know, it only lasts a couple of years. And my argument is, A, first of all, most antivenoms are not that expensive. Mm -hmm. um, Thai Red Cross antivenom, the polyvalent, you can get a neuro polyvalent or a hemato polyvalent. They're $60 a vial. And how many vials do you need? Maybe 10. Okay. Um, for a bite? Like for a single? Okay. Yeah. Um, South African polyvalent, which is mambas, gaboons, puff adders, the spitting cobras from Africa, cape cobras. Mm -hmm. That is a little bit more expensive. It's about, I think it's like $380 a vial now. Okay. Um, so say oh. you get eight or 10 vials, that's, you know, three or $4,000 every two or three years. That is a significant amount of money. My mm -hmm. argument is if that's your hobby, this is part of the expense that goes along with it is mm -hmm. having the antivenom. And if you can't afford it, then you maybe you should choose a different hobby. Right. Keep non-venomous snakes, of which there are many beautiful, amazing things. <laughs> you don't need venomous snakes for snakes to be cool, you know? Exactly. So, I, I, it's just not, I don't think it's my job to take care of you, not you personally, but right. you, you, <laughs> if you want to have a cobra, fine. As long as it's legal where you live, I don't care if you have a cobra. I'm not better than anybody else and I can take care of it and you can't, but it's not my job to take care of you if you get bit. I was actually just about to ask uh, for, I mean, most of our viewers don't have anything venomous, but for the few who were interested in getting a venomous species, mm -hmm. what would you recommend? Can so first I would get the meanest, nastiest, biggest, non-venomous snake that you can. <laughs> like, you know, uh, Alafe carinata, the Chinese king rat snakes, or whatever oh, sure. people like to call them that, you know, usually are trying to attack your face. Big, nasty water snakes. What's the um, that, uh, oh, yeah, Spilodes yeah. are a good choice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything like that that is going to try to bite you anytime you work with it. And if you can do a year without that thing biting you, then you can start thinking about okay. a venomous snake. But if you can't work a big, dangerous, you know, dangerous, big, nasty, non venomous snake without getting bit by it, you have no business with anything venomous. Right. So that would be my first thing. Mm -hmm. Then, yes, get the antivenom first. Now, Makes if sense. you're going to keep native snakes and you live in an area where snakes are, where there are venomous snakes native, so the hospital is going to be keeping antivenom, I'm less concerned about that because a hospital should have it. But if you live in a part of the country where there are no venomous snakes, your local hospital is not going to carry antivenom. I grew up in Cleveland. There are no venomous snakes near Cleveland. There is no antivenom in the hospital in Cleveland because there's no reason for them to have it. I don't, not commenting on the legalities in any of these places, right, but right, if you right. live where the snakes are native, and you're going to keep native venomous snakes, I think the antivenom is much less of an issue. But if you want to have exotics, you've, you've got to have the antivenom. And I'll, I'll say it for you guys, I've said it to other places too, if you want venomous snakes and you want to know how to get your antivenom, if you email me, I will send you a PDF. It tells you how to get it.
No, it's not something I would suggest people do. No. <laughs> but I know that some people do it no matter what you say. Right, right. So that's the best way to go about it. Yeah. But for most of the people watching this, if you want a venomous species, don't just don't get a venomous species. What are the reasons that it would be justifiable to have a venomous species of snake? Oh, that's a good question. A for, a, for a private individual, the people that I feel like do a good job, that I know personally, are people who have a true appreciation for the animal. Yep. They are not doing it because they want to show their dominion over a cobra. They are doing it because they, for whatever reason, and who knows why any of us like snakes, for whatever reason, that passion is triggered by that particular animal. And yep. so they are keeping it because they have a true appreciation for that animal and it happens to be venomous. Mm -hmm. They are not keeping it because it is venomous. If you're keeping something because it's venomous, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Right. That's not, and it shouldn't be about that. Bragging. So for people watching this who are interested in the Kentucky Reptile Zoo, what's the best time of year for them to visit? There's um, amazing stuff here. Not, not in December. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's December right now. It's yeah, it's, not, war it's warm for here right now, that's but great for us. <laughs> yeah, you guys are used to the frozen wasteland of the north, so <laughs> our most active seasons are definitely I would say spring and summer. We have regular open hours from the first weekend in March through the last weekend in October or sometime in November depending on the weather. Okay. We do open by appointment at any time of the year, but it's much I think people get more out of it and enjoy it more if they come during our regular open hours just because we also have talks and you can watch a venom extraction yeah. and things like Got that there's more the there's more almost. going on yeah and for those who aren't <laughs> able to come here if they're living uh, in another country and can't visit right how else can they uh, help you out well we we have a Facebook page we do have a YouTube channel though nowhere near as active as yours well. um, <laughs> <laughs> we um, we have a Twitter we try to answer questions we encourage people to, to talk to us if they want to know things, if they see a video on Facebook or whatnot. Um, if people feel charitable, um, <laughs> they can make a donation on our website, which is kyreptilesu.org or through Facebook. We do get that money. You know, it seems like it goes into the abyss, but it, it really does it come helps. to the institution. It yeah, it does help. We are part of Amazon Smile. So nice. that's if, an easy way to donate. It is, and it doesn't cost you anything. Right. So if you'd like to help a nonprofit, but you're not able to make a monetary donation, but yet you buy supplies on Amazon or, or um, you know, buy your groceries or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you can go to smile.amazon.com instead. And that way Amazon donates a small amount to whatever organization you choose. And I hope you choose Kentucky Reptile Zoo, but... <laughs> well deserving <laughs> you, of it. You can choose uh, and, uh, and then they uh, send us money every once in a while. And for those who want to get really involved, you have internship opportunities, don't we you? We do. So we have a year-round internship program. And interns typically are here for three months. So it's seasonal. So winter, spring, summer, fall. And interns uh, take care of our non-venomous animals. Uh, they interact a lot with the public. So if you're interested in reptile education, you get a lot of experience doing that there you go. Um, while you're here. And then they also do general grunt work and maintenance that's involved with caring for a large collection of animals. So yep. there is floor mopping and tub washing too. <laughs> I'm sure that people watching this channel, I'm sure they wouldn't mind hands-on cleaning I, with I mean, it, snakes. If you mm. want to work with animals, you better get used to cleaning because that's yeah. really what most of it is, yeah. no matter what animal <laughs> you're working with. So true. It's a lot of poop cleaning. Yes. <laughs> so. Thank you for showing us everything. Not a problem. Uh, we highly recommend checking out the Kentucky Reptile Zoo on Facebook. Make a donation since you're a nonprofit. It's tax deductible, It right? is tax deductible. If you make a donation through Facebook, though, they typically show up to me as anonymous donations. So if you make a donation through Facebook and you would like a letter for your taxes, I'm happy to provide that, but you probably need to send me an email or a Facebook message so that I know who to credit. Perfect. Good to know. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> well, thank you again for all of your time no and problem. showing thank us you. around. And thank you for everyone who's watching this and learning about the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. There's some angry crows in the yeah. background. They wanted to be famous. I, I guess. Yes. They were like, pay attention to us. <laughs> If you're ever in the area, be sure to check out the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. We'll put all of their contact information in the description below so you know exactly where to go via um, Facebook, your website. All that will be right down below this video, so just scroll down and see it. Thanks for watching today's video, and we'll see you next time. Before I forget, I would like to once again thank Blackview for sponsoring the... Oh, <laughs> That was a good thing that it's drop proof too. We're good. We're good. It's fine. Uh, anyway, if you're interested in this phone, I do recommend that you check with your local network provider to make sure that it's compatible. Based on our research, we found that it is unfortunately not compatible currently with Verizon or Sprint, but it is compatible with Metro PCS, T-Mobile, AT&T, and some others too. So if it does work with yours, you're in luck because this is a really fun phone.